We will say it like it really is. With dignity and respect. Committed to free speech and common sense. Upbeat and entertaining. Straight talking and direct. We may agitate each other and you. Heartfelt and passionate. Thought-provoking, provocative and controversial. And fearless and truthful. Hello and welcome to The Pledge, the only place for fearless debate in 2017. Now, this was the Prime Minister's face when Sky's Sophie Rich asked for her response to Donald Trump's boast that when he meets beautiful women, he can <laughs> grab them by the... <laughs> <laughs> so, let's check your reaction to this, Greg. Hard Brexit. Hmm. And don't think you're getting off the hook, June. President Trump. On today's show, Michelle's taking on snobby Southerners. Now, who could she mean? June says we should resist making a dangerous change. Greg's got some bad news for the Prime Minister, and Afwa's telling Janet Jackson's critics to keep mum. But first, it's me. Now, while it might be stretching it a bit, is it only me who feels this latest bout of strike action has got a smack of the winter of discontent about it? Just as Jim Callaghan had the road sweepers and the grave diggers, Margaret Thatcher had the miners and the printers, it's an half feel as if Theresa May has got the same with transport sector strikes. The unions took strike action for a sizeable chunk of December and have three days of action this week. No one else can take this sort of high-handed attitude to work. If you applied it here, it would mean June would only turn up for half of her scheduled appearances. <laughs> Hang on, I'm starting to see some benefits after all. <laughs> well, now enough is enough. Enough lost days at work. Enough lost productivity. Enough missed medical appointments. Enough emotional turmoil and enough relationship breakups. Yes, it's reported couples have split as a result of this lunacy. Tough new laws must be brought in fast, otherwise 2017 could turn into a year of discontent. Do you know, you really have become the Daily Mail on two legs. It's, it's that, that, that's it's, about eight words in. Yes, that's about it. eight words that's in. You were, really have become. Is I that mean, all the, the idea that you could just that you should just instantly pass legislation to ban strikes is ridiculous. Didn't say ban. Make it much much tougher. Well, they've, now, done, is, they've done that already, and they've still voted for the strikes. Yes, it wouldn't have. I, it wouldn't. I give you. It wouldn't have set, uh, stopped the London Underground. It wouldn't have stopped British Airways. It wouldn't have stopped Southern. But if you come to Southern. The people listening, uh, watching this, the people watching this in Sussex and in Surrey, oh. they can't go on like this. No. They're losing jobs. But that's not only about the strike. That's about the way Southern Railways is run. I mean, the truth is that... I mean, what was weird about that strike, which I don't quite understand, is that somehow the government is picking up the cost of the strike. That, is, they've got, that, that franchise is a different franchise to all the rest of the rail franchises. And you can't have any, well, why on earth are the government putting up with this? Why doesn't the government do something about the, the company that's got the franchise before it starts attacking the people who are... Because clearly this isn't just about who shuts the doors. This is about a relationship between the people who work there and the people who use it and the company that runs it. No, 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 no. it's politically motivated. It is. If, 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 if Aslef was still about, we'd probably still have gaslights and things like that. This is absolutely... These are, this but, is a but, Luddite okay, union but these, behaving this, in an irresponsible right, fashion. But is it politically motivated yes. both ways? Well, That's the real question. I've got, a, I've got a clip, actually, and then I'll, I'll respond. So if we look at this clip, uh, this is a clip, this is Sean Hoyle, who's um, in charge of the RMT union. So this is what he had to say not that long ago. We've had 50 ballots for strike action this year. That I'm not proud of that. I'm not bragging about it. That shows you the fight we're in. That shows you what our members are up against. If you spit on your own, they just wipe it away. But if we all spit together, we can drown the bastards. <laughs> Yeah, what a nice guy. He also went on to say, any trade unionist with any sense wants to bring down this bloody working class, Tory, sorry, working class hating Tory government, and that's what we want to do. So absolutely, there is a political yes. motive towards all so of this. That's the rhetoric you get at any uh, trade union conference. That that's, right. that's not no, acceptable. No, no, but it's just, but the real question in, in all this is, Southern Rail is not a very well-run company. No. It hasn't been for many years, and actually someone should have done something about that. Now, when you come to the tube strikes, I think you've got a different... I agree with Sadiq Khan. They seem to have gone to industrial action far too early yeah. when there was an opportunity to discuss much more, and I hope they don't do it again. But, but, but I think Southern Rail is a much more complicated project than just 
the drivers in the door. I, I would agree. I think Southern needs to lose that franchise. I think what they've been doing recently is just disgusting, how they can hold people hostage like this. But for me, the unions, it's almost like they're stuck in yesterday's yes. world because I understand that people want to preserve jobs and want to hold on, but the world of work is changing. Technology is upon us, and you cannot just grab and squeeze and hold and stop the change, stop the change. You've got to be fluid. You've got to move with no. the change. Train people to do different jobs as opposed to holding people hostage to protect jobs yeah. that, w that already exist. Yeah, but, this, but, the, but, the, but with what you're saying there, Michelle, that's the problem. In What's that this problem? government isn't training people to do new jobs for the new jobs of the future. And actually, you know, Southern Rail is just an example. The bigger question here is the income inequality that we see happening all over the Western world. So for me, these unions striking is, is symbolic of something that's going to be happening all over again and again when we don't deal with the real problem. And that's why I think you have to look at why people are striking. I mean, I Precisely. think it's an incredible reaction to say, just stop them striking. Obviously, strikes are inconvenient. We all suffer. Nobody's going to stand up and say strikes are great and we yeah. welcome them. And I don't agree with all of the strikes. Definitely. I mean, you know, there are some examples of, I think, irresponsible strike action. But that doesn't mean that we should ban strikes. Look I didn't at why say they're ban strikes. strikes. Well, yes. All that the instinct should be to just stop people striking without no, really no, looking at why they're striking. I mean, look at Southern. OK, as we've all agreed Southern has been a very badly run franchise cannot... for a long time even though we might disagree about whether they're really looking at um, passenger interests whether really they're fighting against modernization the fact is they suspect that by getting rid of driver operated um, they will cut doors, they're, they're just looking to cut staff you know we all know what it's like now at a tube but station if you need someone that. you can't find anyone the commercial interests are not necessarily running things in everybody's benefit. Look at BA. Yeah. BA cabin crew earn £16,000 a year. Right. Who can live on that in London near but a they, major airport? They're not they're forced to go they're to that. Oh, so they knew the salary. the salary when they applied for the job. But Michelle and so Nick, if you don't want to work for £16,000, you don't have to. And job are they going to just Without the right training? Well, how, tell me how you'd run companies then. Everybody will get forty grand. We all know that if everybody is paid a fair wage, they're more likely not to strike, to be motivated to provide a better service. I don't run BA. I don't know exactly good what the margins are. You can't tell me <laughs> that paying cabbing crew. They don't have. But, I mean, I've, I've, it's horrible. Is going but guess to what? But the profits, they're not forced to do it at the gunpoint. Profits, they know going right, in. But, but, but never, they have rights, and that's why they're striking. Never and I can underestimate why. what capitalism is about. There in you the go. end, in the end, and I've run companies. Yeah. And I, in the end, the job of a chief executive is to maximise profits. Yes. That's the job. Now, that's in those, one of their jobs, no, isn't it? No, it's just the, the it main. Is the but they've also job. got they've also got to provide good quality <laughs> service as well. So but that, of only if it maximises profit for yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, which I it would does agree, but days, it's not by the sole large, job. It does. No, no, but that's but the job of the, the the chief executive. If the chief executive doesn't increase profits year by year by year, he doesn't he or He's she out. Yeah. doesn't survive. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. that's the principal role. Now, in the society that is emerging, where a few people, including most of the chief executives, have got very rich, and most people, and the rest aren't. Mm -hmm. What? How do you? How do you adjust yeah. to that? And it seems to me, at some stage, we're going to have to have a, a much more sophisticated sort of capitalism than Precisely the one we've got at the moment. Precisely, Gray, because it's yeah. not Coming fair. Off the subject, and can bit, I but, just say one but, thing to you? Yeah, but then please. I just want to say what I want to bring in. But go ahead, Jim. I'm really, I'm actually really surprised that both you and Michelle would take this view, considering you know you are the sort of the, the one that's always fighting and flying the flag for the man on the street. Because I want I'm him or her to be able to get the work. But you also surely would want him to be paid justly as well. Oh. What, what, what you're saying, Greg, is so true. This unfair system is unsustainable. Yeah, but I, and we're going to see this all over the place. I think that we just don't know what's about to hit us. I did this topic a few weeks ago on the pledge where I was talking about the fourth industrial revolution, mm. the digitization yeah. of the workplace. Yeah. The whole At the moment, we're arguing around who presses a button on a train. Mm. We do it's not absurd. know what is about to hit us because mm. the world, the landscape of I life agree, is going to which is why we need to retrain people. We need, that's not the we need to be able job, to rely so, well, on our is. government to provide people yeah. with the right field, no. to guarantee minimum rights to workers. And when that fails, workers are standing up for their what own rights, mean? and who can blame them? What do you mean them? you need to rely on the government? Yeah, we train. do. We're going to need fewer people opening doors on trains in the future where everything's automated, so we better right? Educate what what jobs are those people going to do? They but need to be getting trained to do jobs that are going to exist but in 10 years' time. that's not just a government responsibility. Of course, it's partly. It but starts a at primary school, A Michelle. private organisation... 
a private organisation, you know, they should be upskilling and reskilling their staff as well. That's not a government responsibility to train the staff of Southern Rail, for example. And maybe that's something we'll see people striking over in the future. You know, who knows? All I know is companies aren't reskilling people in the way they need to. They're laying people off, understandably given their commercial pressures. But if you let ca capitalism unrestrained, as Greg's pointed out, people at the bottom lose out. There won't be jobs for them. No, they won't be getting a fair wage. Who's going to stand up for their rights? The government has not been please, doing that successfully. It's capitalism that creates jobs. I hear what you say, and I hear what you say about British Airways workers. It's not a great salary, but I do take Michelle's point. They know when they go in, and no one's actually allowed me. The way I would want to handle industrial actions, if I can just get those points out there, <laughs> uh, currently ballots require 50% turnout in order to be valid before mm. That has to be far higher. Well, we've half had 70, the work, 80 Half the work. I, I know, but I want it strike. high. And also, the London Underground strike, uh, it was meant to have cost London somewhere in the region of 300 million pounds. Mm. I'm sorry, fine, uh, li unions will have to have fines levied on them. Not the whole amount. I'm not expecting a union to pay 300 million. But if you decide to effectively bring the capital city to a halt, you will have to pay some kind of fine. We've got to stop this high-handed action. Otherwise, they're going to be a wave of Can strikes. Can I ask both of you, honestly, so what do you want to do, just to do away with unions? No, I just said. I just want tough... That's his plan. Much, yeah, that's my plan. Much, much higher. It's much, not going to stop strikes. It's not okay, stop so strikes. If, they, if you put in those much yep. higher yep. criteria, and they meet them, and yep. they still do it. What do you do next? I know what you'll do. You'll put an even higher one. No, no, in the transport. Yeah, you're you're aiming, because you're basically that view that the trade union shouldn't exist. And the, no, 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 no. Never said that. Never said that. And in, in fact, thanks to many, many people watching this now, their, their lives are safer, their, their jobs are safer mm. in factories and elsewhere, and their working conditions are thanks to the unions. They work fantastic in their yeah. time. But something such as the road, Greg, you have to agree. You, I know I made a gag about we'd never see June, but in reality, <laughs> these poor souls, have been, they have yeah. lost their jobs. Businesses are collapsing. Yeah. Southern, they should, the union should be mandated to provide some form of skeleton service. I'm sorry, it's too important a job that you're in. If Southern were actually functioning according to capitalist principles and, and, and having to pay the cost of the strikes themselves instead of being subsidised by the government, I mean, this is, this is the worst of capitalism. It's kind of yeah. the worst case scenario. All of the disadvantages without any of the benefits, you know, they're not being held accountable by market pressures. It's a complete joke. And, and yes, we're the ones suffering, you know, commuters, passengers, families, but it's not the workers who are to blame. It's the system they're reacting against. Surely you can see that. It's just common Can't sense. Can't always blame the bosses, honestly. It's lost on them. I know. <laughs> I agree with this system. But anyway, um, I don't think I've ever mentioned this before, but I am from Hull. Um, it's really? a great, I know, I know. It's a great city filled with good stuff and even better people. And this year, we've got the privilege of being crowned the UK City of Culture. Yay! And after years of mocking, there are some fantastic things for the media to report back to the rest of the country. Alas, it was not the case. The new year had barely begun before the Sun newspaper poured scorn on the award, seeing an <laughs> opportunity to give the city a further kick in. It feels like every time the South gets the opportunity to look down their noses at the North, they cannot do so quickly enough. The Brexit result has highlighted the North-South divide, and I can only see it getting worse. I've lost count of the amount of times I've heard Southerners refer to thick Northerners, and it's time you lot stop looking down your nose at us and realise that the UK exists beyond the London bubble. Well, I just want to ask one question. Are you from a council estate in Hull? <laughs> I swear, well, I, I, have I never mentioned? I don't know. By the way, there's an amazing book called Anything is Possible, which tells the entire story of my Ooh. upbringing. You should, uh, you should uh, purchase it. I but will. yes, a lot of my life was spent on a council estate in Hull, yeah. Um, as, a, as, a, as a fellow uh, council estate person, as you know. Um, well, I just want to say, I, I, I don't... Michelle, I think you're giving yourself and the North way too much credit. I'm sorry. It's not that important because Southerners look down their noses at everyone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure the Scots, the Welsh, and all the Irish, they'd all say the same thing. Um, and also, you know, yes, I get it, but the sun, the, this is the one time actually the newspapers weren't lying. All those things actually happened that In every night. city across the it, land. Yes, but, but, but they happened. In so if every we're saying city. this is, a, and I love Hull, my, my niece is at Hull University, so I'm a big fan of Hull. So if we're saying that Hull is the city of culture for the year, and in fact the American ambassador says it's his favourite British city. He did. 
well, surely then we can also say the stuff about Hull that isn't good. Because it's true. Those things did happen. They're not making it up. And The Sun is a national newspaper. There's, it's not a southern newspaper. There's an easy newspaper. response, isn't there, for the people of Hull. They should do what the people of Liverpool did and say, if you're going to run that stuff, we're not going to buy The Sun anymore. There well, you go. they've tried and, to and, do that. And if they did ban it, they did take it out of most of the news agencies and yeah. they did stop buying it, actually, that would really panic. So as what's happened in Liverpool did. Mm -hmm. But... I, I, I mean, I, I've lived in Yorkshire. I know Hull well. I like mm. Hull. Um, but don't kid yourself, it's only the south that is rude about Hull. Exactly. <laughs> the rest of Yorkshire <laughs> is rude about Hull. It's getting worse. <laughs> it's getting worse. Yeah, it is so true. I, I think that the capital of culture thing is a great idea, and I think it's really good to attract people to cities they wouldn't otherwise go to. But I do worry that it's not a substitute for having genuine reasons, you know, a functioning economy, a manufacturing-based jobs, because well, jobs look, at, look at Derry in London, Derry, you know, Derry, London, Derry, whatever you want to call it, that was the last UK capital of culture. Three years on, they've admitted there's no money to actually see through the legacy projects that they promised as part of the year. You know, while it was the capital of culture, people went there, people visited, and now it's kind of back to business as usual. So I don't think it's a substitute for having kind of organic reasons for people to visit a place. I mean, it might give it a short-term boost, but then what happens next? And I think, you know, there is a bigger problem about what's happening in the north and you know for me it's not looking down and noses at, and my grandmother's from yorkshire you know i feel really um strongly attached to yorkshire as well i spent a lot of time last year in bradford for various reasons and um you know there are some businesses that have put their headquarters in bradford and they're struggling to attract people who just don't want to live there mm. you know and so Wow. You kind of, you need, you know, you need more I, things happening. You need a kind of virtuous circle I, of, of jobs and, and creative industries and manufacturing. And at the moment, all our economy is based in London because of the financial services sector. And it's just, it just means inevitably most of the country is not thriving. No, but Hull is a classic, I mean, I, as I say, I spent quite a lot of time in Hull at one time. And I asked why, I mean, first of all, Hull had the worst education uh, system in the country. It did. It came bottom of, of, of mm. all, all the... The, uh, the measures. Um, don't judge I, my uh, don't no, judge my educational standards no, on that. Though. <laughs> but I also asked, uh, well, why is this? And the explanation I was given was, well, if you were male, and it's a very male-based city, if you were male in, what do you mean it's a male-based city? Well, it, it's oh, it's very be... macho Hull as a city, isn't it? Well, 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 I would explain some of Michelle's. No, what it's a very is <laughs> and I respect Greg, by the way, because you set up um, a, b a big BBC headquarters in I your did. time there, oh, which yeah, um, okay. it did. It made a it made a difference to the city. But, but, but the real problem was that the, the the city was based on on the fishing industry, and the fishing industry closed down, mm. and. The kids who, who they tell me when they, the boys, particularly at school, they were told, well, don't, uh, we don't have to bother with education because you're going on the boats. Mm. And suddenly there were no boats but, to go on to. Mm. Now, that's taken probably 20, 30 years to transform. And I hope how... I, I was really pleased when it became the city of culture because, I, you know, there were always in, really interesting things in Hull. And I sincerely hope that as a, that as a, as a city and... And as a local authority, they get their act together and it Me really well, I, Unlike you, Michelle, and you, June, I don't share a lot about my background, but I can actually now reveal this is going to be a love-in because I totally agree with what you said. My mum was from the north. She's from Lancashire. She moved to Leicester as a... Before she was even in primary school, so I have a northern mum, so I, I'm a big fan of the north. I'm also a big fan of the sun. I love the Sun newspaper. Oh I, I worked on the Sun newspaper. I learnt a lot of my craft. And I regularly read the Sun. And I wonder whether you saw the Sun over the festive period when they took you around Hull and all the readers were treated to this wonderful centre page spread. In which, Michelle Dubry, you said, there's a hull of a lot of love here. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Michelle Dubry, where do you live? I split my time. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I Michelle Dubry, yes, where do you. I split my time between Hull and London. I have a house in both places. You, you might have a house. I mean, people have houses. He's got houses all over the world. Yeah, he lives there. Yeah. I split my time, and I am I am really keen to spend more of my time actually in Hull. And if Sky was to open um, a studio in Hull, no, they've got I more sense than this. They, they, they're they're not spending time. the taxpayers' money in Sky. That's the bloody devil. He can open bureaus in Hull and everybody else because no, no, he just no. shakes the money no, tree no, and the is, bloody money falls no, down. What is, unlike what, real business. What is really interesting about what we did in Hull when we opened a new which we. Funded. A new BBC region, well, it was funded by the licensee, and a new That's region me. actually 
I think the I think the people watching our local shows went up by thirty percent. Oh, wow. oh well, here we go. No, big in Hull. That's the BBC's new slogan. No. We're big in Hull. God, you, <laughs> you know, he, it's because something. you occasionally talk to somebody from Hull on your radio Regularly. show. You, th you think you have an understanding, no, but, don't but you? But bringing it back to my my I key point, Hull. I believe, and I do believe that there is this feeling amongst, and it's particularly within the London bubbles, yeah. and not I'm not going to say the whole of the south, that you somehow feel or people feel that they are better than those people in the north. So, for example, and I bring it back to what the Sun newspaper did, yes, I understand that Hull's had a kicking for many years, and it's not just about Hull, by the way, it's much broader, but it had a kicking for many years. There was an opportunity to do something good about the city, and even then, people could not and still cannot help themselves but give the city a kicking again and again and again. It's like... You, to your point, the schools are different, people's educational results are different, the public spending between the North and the South is different. And all I want is I want um, the but, Northerners to... You keep telling us, how much do you get your shoes repaired when you go up to Hull? Remind me, how much Oh, they're dirt cheap, you love yeah. this about yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I applaud it, it, but it's, you get your whole shoes healed and booted, I don't know, for three quid and down And I get city. much cheaper well, no, rounds. Wonder, no wonder we get more money down south. It's more expensive to have your shoes repaired. Yes, it's more expensive to live down south. Yes, so we so need more money. Yes, but you can't. Thank you. Yeah, but what you need, and it is so, when we talk about the city of culture, I think mm. the city of culture has been fantastic for Hull, and I hope that it has a legacy. And what I'm seeing, actually, and one of the, the things that excites me the most, is the aspiration levels of Going the people up. within Hull. Yeah. I sort of watched the Made in Hull light show over the Christmas period, and I could see so many residents, they're sitting there going, yeah, this is awesome, we can do this, we can do this, and it's about the people, uh, the, the northern folk understanding, actually, mm. that, you know, that mm. we can create new economies for ourselves, so we've got Siemens, for example, in Hull, which is like a, a big wind, te a wind program, turbine. I know, but it's so not it's just about Michelle, Hull, it's in broader. in the case of the sun, they kind of did both. You had the positive spread yeah. with you, yeah, yeah. fair enough, and, and then the spread that was just honest yeah. about what yeah. was actually happening Yes, in but the you, city. Say it's, you say it's honest, you know what happened. You said some news editor or some <laughs> sat in a meeting and said, why don't we, it's a whole city of culture, let's yeah, have a good idea. Why don't we just go and find oh, no. every awful thing that's <laughs> happening in South Hull? That's, exactly what, see that's exactly what newspapers do. You, you <laughs> know that. Yes, I love you know that. Right, my fellow half-Northerner, right. I've got something for you. Come with me. Right. Oh. We're not going to the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow, by any In your dreams, my friend, in your dreams. Right. Now, now, seen as you claim to yes. be so affiliated with the North, I've yes. got a bit of a geography oh, test gosh. for you. I thought you might. First yes. things first, yes. I want you to tell me yes. where is Hull? Hull? Yes. Um, kind of this ish area, really. No, it's more kind of there. Oh, okay, yeah, right, you, okay, okay. okay. You just got right. Whiz Beach. <laughs> <laughs> right, I was sort of, oh, yes, okay. Yeah. My second uh, okay. point Go on. Scarborough. Scarborough, Scarborough. Where is Scarborough? Scarborough is going to be here. Not, yeah, that's not too far off. I'll kind of give you that. Okay. It's round about yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, My yeah. next one, yeah, the market on. town of Darlington. Where Darlington, is it? Darlington is very on... It's on the Yorkshire County Durham border, so I'm going to go sort of here-ish. Yeah, it's probably not too far off. I'd probably yeah. swing it around there somewhere. <laughs> You're regretting this far. test now, I know, you? I want June up here, that's what I want. <laughs> and my last one, Preston. Preston is in Lancashire, so we've got to come over to the other side of the country. Uh, great about, South Great about, I'll go about there-ish, roughly. Not, yeah, you're not too far right. off. Right, and this, by the way, everybody, this is where Michelle lives, right? <laughs> Michelle <laughs> lives <laughs> there. Uh, this, is, this is what Michelle does. Thank you. She... <laughs> Uses transport. Thank you. Michelle lives too. there. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd picked June for that. He always gets it, doesn't he? Okay, well, uh, and that, and by the way, that train service between London and Yorkshire is brilliant. And it, it is. You get there in two hours. Anyway, it's over to me now. I just don't think that Theresa May can deliver her shared society. It's not that the Prime Minister isn't genuine in her ambition to do something about the burning injustices in 21st century Britain. I think she is. And who other than the Thatcherite wing of the Conservative Party can disagree with her when she says that government has a duty to intervene to help those just getting by? But slogans are easy. Action isn't. Here are just a few of my ideas of what she could do. She should increase spending on the National Health Service. She should ensure the lowest paid public sector workers get proper wage increases and give real power back to local authorities. The trouble is, doing any of that means increasing taxation nationally and locally. Now, I, for one, would be willing to pay more. But it's hard to see any government in the modern age, let alone a Tory government, voting for higher taxes. The end result? 
Well, I think those suffering from burning injustices continue to suffer. And Theresa May ends up failing to deliver as Prime Minister. Greg, I feel like we hear a lot about this, that Theresa May is genuine, you know, she genuinely wants a fairer society and she often speaks about the way black people are tre treated in the criminal justice system. She's been speaking a lot about mental health for children. It sounds good, but I really would question how genuine that is, because for me, it's not just about how you turn the slogan into reality. The reality is a shared society means distributing wealth. If you don't distribute the wealth of those at the top towards those at the bottom, then it doesn't actually mean anything at all. It's meaningless. And furthermore, let's look at what Theresa May did when she was Home Secretary. Now, on some things, I have to applaud her. The way she treated the family of Stephen Lawrence when it emerged that the police had been spying on them, the way she spoke out about stop and search. Yeah. So on some things, she was very strong, but on many, she was deeply illiberal. Look at the uh, Home Office Go Home vans that encourage people to spy on potential immigrants in their own community. Look at the way mental health services have deteriorated dramatically under the Conservative government. So for me, you know, whether it's genuine or not doesn't really matter because the fact is we all know how you create a shared society. You redistribute wealth, you help people who are suffering with public services that really work. And she's never declared any intention to do that and neither has her party. Shame, isn't it? Shame. Because you look so lovely, you're going to look horrible in a boiler suit in North Korea because that's what I've just heard from you. It is a fact. It is a fact that the inequality in this country is on the decrease. It is a fact that the richest 3% have never paid more tax. They're paying almost 30% of the whole tax take. How much more can they possibly give? Where I agree with Greg, I don't know why a Prime Minister gets hooked into these damn silly slogans. What was it before? The big society. Yeah. It's now mm. become the shared society. Mm. You're right, Afwin, it's absolutely meaningless. And I do take your point. It's all very well, so we're going to do this, we're going to do this. If you look at mental health, actually, funding has been cut, and there yeah. are more mm. people with mental health issues on the streets than ever before. That can't be wrong. But what I don't understand, I thought she was quite a canny woman. Why she's talked to such absolute cobblers as a shared society, it will be a millstone round her neck. But I think it will be. But maybe, she, you know, just give her some credit. Maybe she, she does believe do it. it. Maybe she does oh, say she there is something, there is a problem about the inequalities within our society and she would like to do something about it. The problem is she's in a political party that won't allow her to do that. But Greg, because in the end, you have to do that by, as you say, by redistribution wealth. And you have to do that, but therefore, by taxing people who are earning uh, and at the top level more so that it goes down. Well, I've, got a, I've got a New Year's resolution for you, and that is, why don't you volunteer to single-handedly pay more tax? <laughs> because every time we have a conversation, yeah. your resolution yeah. is... We should tax people no, more. No, what I'm yeah. and no, you I'm do. Not, no, yeah, what yeah. I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you can't make these sorts of promises unless you're, unless you're that. willing to redistribute. I, I agree. Well, unless through you're taxation. Willing. No, you can't make those kind of promises without allocating funds to them. Yes, right? exactly. Well, where's where's the so, where come from? so where I would, I don't want to pay a penny more tax until I feel that the tax that I'm currently paying is spent properly and not wasted. But, but thankfully. The decision on whether you are not paying more tax won't be left to you. It'll no. be done by government. Yeah, but why and are you? Why are you so? Um, I, I'm not. I'm saying. I'm, all I'm pointing out is that there are contradictions, and the contradiction is: I want to have this much better society. I want poorer people to be much better off. We've got to help them, but we're not prepared to tax anybody to help them. Yeah, but, yeah, but you don't just raise money just by taxing. People pay a lot of tax as it is. And what, what frustrates yeah, yeah. me is I feel, of course, the NHS is short of funds. No one will dispute that. But there is so much wastage and so much opportunity to create efficiencies oh, already yeah. across the whole public services. And until, until everyone has looked at how are we investing the taxation that we currently have, is it, is it spent properly and yeah, wisely yeah. and most efficiently? Only when that answer to that question no, is yes, would I be willing to give any more? But okay, let's, just, let's just take a, like, just take a look at this right. clip of, of uh, Mrs May when she was interviewed on Sky last week and what she said. Just to press you on the ring-fenced new money for mental health, because otherwise there is a danger it will just be swallowed up by the crisis in the NHS, isn't it? Well, but first of all, money is going into mental health, but it's always wrong for people to assume that the only answer to these issues is about funding. 
you see, in some ways she's right that it isn't the only answer, but it is one of the answers. But it's your it's solution to everything. Answer. The problems with the NHS, we need to pay more tax. I remember this in the last... Yeah, the problems with, I think, immigrant handling migration. The problem with the England football manager. Pay more tax. It's your solution <laughs> to absolute... There are people out there no, who can't pay more tax. No, 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 I don't think yeah, I solved it. He's not saying everybody should pay more tax. I can't pay. How much more but, have I got to but, give? But, but, the, the, but the truth of the matter is that actually our taxation system isn't fair. That actually, the the the, the you did listen to those figures. I listened to those figures, oh. but as you know, there are many loopholes within those figures, and actually, a lot of corporations get away with not paying their fair share of tax too. And if you look at the the issue, oh. you're talking about society being the fairest it's ever been. That's not true. Because uh, less, inequ uh, less inequality. Less policy. inequality, because people don't feel that way. And, you know, I'm not harping on about Brexit or what, what, again and again, but actually, when you look at the people who voted out, they voted out for that very reason, because they don't feel the system is fair. And it's everything we've been talking about this today. So I think what Theresa May actually needs to do is to create a conversation between the nation what does that mean? about where people what are. The bloody because hell does you that know mean? what? If you are paying more tax and you know where it's going and you know exactly what it's going to do and you know what her long term vision is, you're happy to pay. But you don't I would keep be. putting more water into a leaky bucket. Ah. That is my. That is what I feel. Yes, but, 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 but I mean, that but Have you ever tried running a national health service? No, I haven't. No, but what I exactly. have done. What I, no, no, no. Don't tell me you screwed up that. You screwed up everything else. Let, let me respond because what I have done for many, 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 many years yeah. is worked and led significant business transformation programs where I have looked and I have used technology to create efficiencies. Where we have tried, we've changed businesses, we've changed strategies. And, and, and you think and the people aren't employing people like you in the national health? Service. Well, no, the National Health Service has been stuffed full of consultants. But like the NHS has, has wasted stuffed millions on failed, on, IT consultants. No, on failed IT projects, for example. Like millions and millions across the whole public sector on, uh, on broken IT. I, 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 sorry, I am going to have to interrupt now because it is time for a break. And mm. afterwards, I will be telling you why I think seeing more of this on our streets would be a major mistake. On July 7th, 2005, 52 people were killed in London by four terrorists who had grown up in Britain. It was a day many of us will never forget. Days after the bombing, armed police mistakenly shot and killed Jean Charles de Menezes, an unarmed Brazilian man. Six years later, Mark Duggan was killed by armed police in Tottenham, and his death sparked the worst riots in the UK in over two decades. It's because of killings like this I was filled with dread this week when I read that the Met Police Federation announced that it would be asking its members if they would be willing to carry guns. I do not believe arming the bobby on the beat is going to reduce terrorist attacks. Instead, we need to intensify the resources we provide our intelligence services, who, may I add, are doing a phenomenal job keeping us safe. Let's not rush into something that could create even more mistrust in our police. We are better than that, and they are better than that too. Um, I admire the approach of the uh, Met Police to actually ask their, their members what would be their view on, on being armed. I think that's a, a good thing to do. If I was a police officer and somebody asked me, would I be a police officer in a metropolitan city in 2017 without being armed, I would say absolutely no way. No way would I stand on the streets of, for example, London, Manchester, Leeds, wherever, without being armed as a police officer? Absolutely not. I understand your point. I understand your concerns. Um, I would absolutely expect any... I would expect all police officers to have, at the very least, a taser, and um, most of them in the metropolitan cities to have a gun, to be armed, to protect us adequately, for sure. But Michelle, we live in a country where guns are illegal, mm -hmm. so actually the vast majority of people 
don't have guns, and in fact, the vast majority of criminals in this well, country don't actually have guns. Yeah, but we also live in a country well, let where me, there's... Let me, let me finish. It's not illegal, it's well, just possession is regulated. Well, well, yeah, yeah. So and then also, shooting. also, let me add to that, that actually we have a police firearms unit. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a specific segment in the police federation that is trained, that goes through an intense two-year process of training where firearms are concerned. So we have something in place that is working. But we Why have... does this need to be changed? So what I would say to that is that it's about, what, 4.4% of the police officers are yeah. trained firearms. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, if some absolute idiot um, is running around Oxford Circus with a gun, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say to him, just hold on, give us 10 minutes whilst the armed units can uh, find the, their way through the traffic and come but the, armed, but the armed response are very quick in their time to, to yeah, actually respond. Some... Let's put some facts on this. There are on. I think you, you're wrong and you're right. There are a total of 14,753 police firearms operations in the year ending March of yeah, last year. Yeah, but it year. only went that's up by 5% from, right. from, right. from the year... 0.5% from the year before. Hold on. That's the whole of the UK. Yeah. I think for you to single out the very unfortunate and tragic shooting of Jimenezes and Mr Duggan, of course, mm -hmm. sh shocking, I think is very unfair. The police are using their guns at an extraordinary level and most every time, 99.999%, they are successful operations. And what I'm saying is... Hold with. On. Please, where, what you've just quoted there, those are police officers that well, are t intensely trained right. to use those guns. Where you are right is, it would radically alter the police model in this country, which really? is the one that works. Yeah. We, are, we ask them to police us, and it's only officers who choose to be armed who come forward. I, and who want to take the training. And it, you're not saying we do away with guns completely, are you? you we I'm, have armed I'm, units. Yes. I'm, no, no, I'm when, happy with armed units. What Michelle's I'm saying point, is for the bobby on the beat, no way. To Michelle's point, no when Lee Rigby was fatally attacked on the streets in Woolwich, yeah. the time to get the armed unit was seven minutes. Yeah, it took so seven so minutes. So that is pretty incredible. Yes. I think the way it works at the moment is right. It's I don't. Want, I, I think we have enough guns on the streets with Precisely. police officers. I find it extraordinary now. You go to shopping malls up and down the country. I understand why. Yep. And they're walking around with guns. Yep. I, I looked in wonderment. Safe. I looked in wonderment when I saw these Christmas markets, and I thought, "Why the hell have we got guys around Northampton and Wolverhampton and Birmingham?" And then we saw what happened in Berlin. I think we are blessed with a great police service. I Which think you I do them a disservice with. by talking about Demenezes and Duggan. There were uh, extenuating That's circumstances there. That's not doing there. a disservice. But that to your is main stating point, what happened. But agree, to your main I, point, you're right. I, I, I mean, it's good to hear you talking some sense, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> what a, what a <laughs> nice How surprise. How does that feel for you? <laughs> it was during the break. I had a lot no, down. Yeah. They'll never let you back into LBC. Um, you know, it's interesting that when you actually speak to police officers, you know, and, and the head of the police federation or someone similar said recently, when they actually speak to them, most of them don't want to be armed. You know, you don't sign up to the yeah. police. Michelle, you're not a police officer for a reason. Most police officers <laughs> say sign up to the police, not seeing it as an yeah. armed service, you know, and I respect the fact that our police don't see themselves that way. And for, for more than a century, they've been doing a very good job without being armed with guns. Doing a fantastic and job. there's plenty of evidence. Just look at America that actually when everyone's armed, it just escalates levels of violence. Our police are very well trained in de-escalating things yes. without guns. Fewer people die as a result. Mm. When you look at the number of people who die in police custody, it is disturbing because nobody should die following contact with the police under the yeah. wrong circumstances. Yeah. It does happen. It's not in huge numbers. Yeah. It's impossible to imagine those numbers wouldn't increase if more police officers were armed. And also, just to finish my point, the people who do die following contact with the police are disproportionately people suffering from mental illness, yeah. people from black and ethnic minorities. Yeah. And that's why I think even though the numbers are small, we do need to be extremely careful about the idea that more police officers would be able to fatally kill. I think yeah. that is something that our yeah. police are wary of for a very good reason. And we oh. know, but back to your point there, if you look at um, the stats on stop and search, we still haven't got that under control. So for me, I would be completely worried I, I, with instances I mean, like this. this I don't know how I can say this, but I agree with Nick. You see, I, when, yeah. I, when you do go... When I go to... Um, Airports, or mm -hmm. you go to big shopping smells, and, and you see guys walking around. I'm quite shocked. This wasn't the the bit that I was brought up. Does in. it not make you feel safer? No, it makes no it difference. Doesn't. No, because I, I honestly don't think I don't think having armed police would have stopped what happened in Berlin. I really don't. Think I don't. Would have made no. Uh, I think, but I. So I'm shocked by it. What interests me is what what will the vote say? Because I suspect the majority of police will say, "No, this no, is the this is yeah. yes, this is the police force members. I joined. I joined, uh, and we have rather a good police force, I suspect, yeah. compared to many other countries, we because we they decided not to use arms and not to arm the police. But I'm still quite shocked by how many now are armed. 
the terror threat is but, severe. We have we live in no, a world Michelle, where terror threat is severe. Our intelligence services have done a phenomenal job in keeping us safe. Yeah, so brilliant. So I'm what we're that. doing clearly is working. Also, also so why Michelle, are we going to change it's something that is working? Let's intelligence and it's out. If some idiot is wandering around the streets shooting, because you're talking about, oh yeah, we, well, you know, they do a great job of like, um, Michelle, what was the word you used? Basically, like calming down. If someone's wandering around with a gun, I don't want someone trying to negotiate. When you, don't don't negotiate. you talk about the terrorist threat, the greatest terrorist threat facing our nation right now is lone wolf attacks, yes. right? People who go off often with explosive devices, that's the fear. There is no way that somebody determined to detonate a suicide bomb, for example, who's been planning on his own in a bunker somewhere, could be stopped by everybody on the beat having, having a, gun. a gun. But who will be affected is everyday people living their lives I'm, in the community, on, and I that's never, why I never said I want everybody on the beat to have a gun. That's not what I said. What I said was, in large metropolitan cities, so for Scarborough, would we, I expect we, we people to be that. patrolling Scarborough Beach with guns? No, I wouldn't. That's a bit a bit weird. You might do it in Hull if Le you read the <laughs> <laughs> Leeds, Manchester, I don't know, no, Glasgow, London. No, Michelle, Absolutely. September 11th, the US police officers carry guns. They still were attacked with terrorists. Okay. It still happened. Okay, all right. So well, it, we don't have guns now, and I'm glad about it. And onto something more wholesome now for my okay. topic. It's me next. And I want to ask why this star's beautiful announcement should cause such controversy. I was thrilled when I heard the news that Janet Jackson has given birth to a baby boy at the age of 50. Unfortunately, this felt like quite a lonely celebration. Janet Jackson may be a world-famous pop star, but in many ways, she's not so unlike the rest of us. She's been intensely pursuing her career. She struggled to meet the right partner. Then things finally came together for her. And guess what? It took a little longer than she probably expected. As women, we can't win. Just like men, women are working flat out, trying to repay student loans, save a deposit for a home, or just make ends meet. If we decide to go it alone and become single parents, guess what? We're pilloried as evidence of a broken society. If we wait until we're financially secure and in a stable relationship, we're criticized for being too old. None of the outrage channeled at Jackson seemed to be hurled in Mick Jagger's direction, however, even though he just had a child in his 70s with a woman almost 20 years younger than his oldest child. <laughs> if that's not a double standard, I do not know what is. <laughs> Um, get ready for this. Broadly speaking, go. I'm in total agreement with you. You must have I, got I, something seriously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm I, worried now. Yeah, what yeah, I, just say? I think it's great. The one thing I just want to get your view on, I mm. think the world's oldest mum, that can be verified, is a Spanish woman who, with the aid of IVF, and this is what I want to get you on, had children at age 66 yeah. using IVF. My concern there is that Please, God, she lives forever, but it's likely that very young children are going to lose their mum. Now, I know that happens anyway, but it's not a perfect world, but where do you stand on IVF with women in their late, mid to late 60s? I mean, that's not the norm. No, no, it's I didn't not the say norm. Well, I know, I know. So, um, and I guess it's not the norm for a reason. I think most women in their 60s probably don't fancy having an infant, to be fair. No. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> speaking of the ones I know. So, sure. I think that... Um, it's never good to kind of make general rules based on exceptional cases, mm. you know, both as a, a woman who wants to have a child that age is so unusual, and a system that would allow that to happen is pretty unusual. But I think, and I think it's very difficult, you know, and as a so mother myself, it's very difficult to police other people's decisions about having children. It's, it's not right. It's, though, very, it? it's very difficult to, not to right, police though, it. Is it? Just people are living longer than ever, Nick. Not so, right, but, though, so, so you don't know how long she's going to live. Not right, no, though, no, is it? I know how long she's going to live. I know how long she's going to live because she's already died. Oh, no, no, that's someone else, I think. The one that you're talking about, oh, I think, sorry, the one that had um, IVF treatment oh, at age 66, yeah, is she, she um, sadly passed away three months after giving birth. And the only oh, reason that she got the IVF, by the way, was because she didn't necessarily tell the truth about her age. She told the clinic that she was 55. Right. Sorry to put a dampener on that um, conversation. <laughs> As I said, <laughs> unusual case. Mm. But, but the use of IVF, which is fantastic. Which is usually marvelous, the case for an older mother. Marvelous. There is, of course, a cost implication with this that there must be an age at which you have to say to a woman I'm terribly sorry it's just not going to happen there is I would like there to be some gender parity here because 
I, I completely get the point about it not being ideal for parents to be old enough that they might not live to see their children through childhood, right? But how come we're so happy to celebrate men having children what? in their 70s, but I think even 80s and 90s, and yet we regard it as so kind of unnatural when women do it? I mean, I, but how, why I is that? I think there is a cut-off point for IVF on the NHS for women. Oh, is there is on the NHS. Yeah. So I think I don't, you can't get it on the NHS, mm. I think, if you're over... 50. I think it's younger than that, actually. I'm just a few years younger than Mick Jagger. <laughs> And I can't think I of a worse. I can't yeah. think of a worse experience at this age than to have another baby. But now I presume Mick won't have that problem because I don't. I'm not sure he lives with the the mother anyway. And I yeah. presume there'll be all sorts of support, support. and the rest of it. But I think the real thing about older parents is it's it's tough having children. Mm. Uh, you know, you watch people in their thirties having their first child, and they look. They're quite shocked, Lattered, by, shocked yeah. by the experience. I, I'm not sure I want to do that in my 60s well, and 70s. As someone who's likely, you know, if I become a mother, likely to be an old mother, um, you know, hey, I'm all for it. I'm like, go Janet, there's hope for us all yet. <laughs> Where do I sign up? <laughs> It's a personal choice, isn't it? And this is something that yeah. I've thought about quite often because I know I want to be a mum. I'm from a big family. The mm. thought of not having children, it, it's just not possible. It's not going to happen. I want to have a family by whatever means. But the reality is, you know, for love nor money, unfortunately, I cannot seem to find uh, a relationship and stay in a relationship. So I'm single and I'm getting older and older and older. I'm not trying to hit on you or anything, well, don't worry. I don't think genetically it would be very nice. No. <laughs> You just need to correct one thing. The uh, Spanish woman that you mentioned actually, uh, she uh, died three years. After oh, was it three years? Anyway, three so we, we, we move on from that. You, you, your main principle, Afwa, is that you, you felt that there was a, a sort of ugly tone then to where yeah, the Janet Jackson. Yeah, double standards. Was. Where did you? Tell no me one where, says anything oh, about that. There were various man. newspapers. The, the um, Manchester. Um, I can't remember which paper. But what was said, the sort of thrust of their article? They said that it was it was it was irresponsible of her because she was too old. She wouldn't be. That's ridiculous. She wouldn't be able to really see her children through to the age they needed her because she'd be too old. Um, another paper said that they felt that it was you know it was a step too far and it was kind of unnecessary natural and you know and I can see where they're coming from in the sense that obviously for me the biological optimum yeah. for us to be having children is probably about 18 really you know that's but when we're well, not when, emotionally though no, no but mentally, I'm just talking by, by yeah. if you're, this is these are biological arguments yeah. no one's saying that emotionally age 50 you're not capable of raising a child you're probably much better equipped much than when better. you're 20 mm. um, but you know in terms of your fertility your energy levels the younger the better really mm. We do not live in a society that makes it remotely practical for most women in their even early 20s but to be, to be financially she'll be, she'll be a great prepared for oh, having children. No, she, she will be the life uh, experience. I she'll be a stunning can oh, imagine. Thanks, I can't do imagine think, anything better. Do you think this matters? So if you're saying that people looked at Janet Jackson and said, oh, whatever, whatever, do, do you think she cares? Well, I think it's not nice. I don't think Janet Jackson let, let, oh, We've got a clip of Janet, and actually, yeah. I want you to see the way she explained what she was doing. We're in the second leg of the tour, and there actually has been a sudden change. I thought it was important that you be the first to know. My husband and I are planning our family, um, so I'm going to have to delay the tour. Please, if you can try and understand that it's important that I do this now. I mean, Aww. the joy she looks yeah, so in how she's saying it just bubbles through. How can you not be pleased for her but that's what, when you see that? That's what I'm saying, though. So she's happy. She's living her life in the way that's right for her. So why does it? Why does she care what no, anyone there, else thinks? There is a double standard. And think about it. What's George Clooney? How old is he now? 54, 55? Definitely so if he and Amal Clooney announce tomorrow that they're expecting a baby, everyone's going to be like, great. No one's even going to mention his age. Whereas with Janet Jackson, it's a big story. And her husband's younger than her. I don't so think... I think it is a big story. Well, I've got yeah, I think, I think the truth is, we've all got beyond. Off. We've all got beyond that. There's, a, there's still some guy on a news desk saying, "Oh, let's make this into a big story," you know, as they do. But the truth is, we're all relaxed about this now. But you say, the you world say, changed. You say that, and I mean, this yeah, isn't this know. isn't a discussion about IVF, but there are quite stringent cut-off points for IVF on the NHS, and a lot of people think that. Um, the state shouldn't be supporting older women to have children. Now, you know, you, the two of you, what you've described as your experience is not at all unusual. You know, Ooh. it takes us longer as women to sort out our careers, to be in a position where we can take time off work, to have the right partner. Yeah. You know, we're often in our late 30s or 40s by yeah. the time that happens. I'm what afraid. are we supposed to Greg do? Greg and I can't be there for all of you. <laughs> uh <-huh. Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> it's time to give birth to something else. Roll up the red carpet. There's a new award in town. And this one won't mean more self-righteous speeches by Meryl Streep and Tom Hiddleston. At least I hope not. As you know, the pledge is all about saying it as it is. And so we're launching a new award. We're calling Straight Talker of the Week. And this week, the honour of choosing the winner has fallen to me. And it is Donald Trump for this piece of classic straight talking. They looked at that nonsense that was released by maybe the intelligence agencies. Who knows? But maybe the intelligence agencies, which would be a tremendous blot on their record if they, in fact, did that. A tremendous blot. Now, you don't necessarily have to agree with the message, but the delivery, June, is fantastic. We are in for red-hot times at the White House. <laughs> he calls it the way it is, right? <laughs> well, why is it a tremendous blot on their record? No, mind that, no, mind about that. Him? Don't, don't you love the straight-talking aspect? Style. No, I don't love popcorn. the straight. I think no, it is it's... an absolute embarrassment to the office of the presidency. And you know what? It's going to take no, America on. years to come out of straight, this. As we go, this is the new award, straight mm -hmm. talking. I'll bring Afro in. That is straight talking. You didn't play the bit where he said... Let me go again. I wouldn't do that because, you know, I wouldn't have done that in that hotel then because there were cameras everywhere. <laughs> <by him. laughs> I was like, that is what I call, you know, a denial with integrity. Great. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful <laughs> thing, the that. straight talking. <laughs> isn't uh, well, he could well win this award every week. He will. <laughs> because he's going to come up with something every week. And, and as it just comes out of nowhere, most of it. I mean, actually, this is a much, much more serious story than this. I mean, the, oh. the story, oh. which we've not discussed, you? the story is really, <laughs> is really serious. And if you watch the Obama's farewell this week and then you Wonderful. watch Trump's press yeah. conference, you just thought, you how could show. you have you go from Rick there to there? <laughs> Help Nick. me. I'm just talking straight talking. Nick, what an excellent oh. choice for that award. He absolutely won it. I wanted to get my popcorn and sit down and settle yes. in. I yes. found it fascinating yes. what's coming out of his mouth at yes. the moment. So, well done. Great. High five, in fact. Yep. Okay. Horror movie. No, Horror no, no, no. movie. We were all there well, in the well, it's it's No, it is straight. I, I'll give you that. That it is. Ah, it, it, it does end. deserve to win the straight talking award because it is dead straight talking. Not. I just it just happens talking. to be rubbish. But I mean, it is straight. I talk. mean, I think we need to think about what the definition of straight talking is. But that's yeah. for another, well, another time. Well, another we were not week, consulted about this, were we? <laughs> well, no. no but you, you took the award. <laughs> well, I tell you what, <laughs> and I'm, it. I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah. As we're on the subject of awards, I'm going to make another quick nomination. You may have noticed that one Rachel Johnson is not with us today. That's because she's skiing. And in honour of her uniquely privileged <laughs> lifestyle, I'd like to suggest a special judges award, the Elitist Metropolitan Liberal Snowflake Award. Now, panel and pledges. June, you'll agree with that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I second that nomination so hard, <laughs> Just joking, Rachel, and steady on the slopes. That's it for this show. We've tweeted Donald Trump for a comment on his award. We'll let you know if and when he replies. See you next week.